Good evening. It's Friday evening, and uh, it's a little bit after 7, I think 7.18. Um, I've been on the phone with someone, and Fridays I'm never on just at 7 o'clock, and uh, just fit in with my schedule, and so I am uh, now ready to do my my evening devotions. And uh, this day, Friday, we are in Acts chapter 9. want to welcome, I see Rob's on, and... Uh, um, Rob was helping me light up this room. I don't have it lit up like I will in a little while, and I'll be changing and I'll be getting ready to uh, uh, tape my sermon for uh, the uh, children's sermon and my sermon for the uh, uh, church service for this coming Sunday. And uh, because I have COVID, as you know, and I won't be able to be in church, so we'll do it uh, by video. And hopefully the now, the media team is great, so hopefully this will all work out. So that's um, my intro, and I'm going to, uh, well, greetings, the Lord be with you. And we'll start as we always do, as we make the sign of the cross, and we say, I am under the, or we are under the care of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, today, uh, we are we began yesterday in chapter eight into that second section of the early church with the persecution of Stephen, his his death, uh his martyrdom at the end of chapter seven. Then persecution arose, much of it led by the uh, by Saul, uh who was who was uh searching for Christians everywhere, dragging them out of their homes went off to Damascus to find more Christians, and that's where we find him here at uh, chapter 9. And here today, we're going to hear the story of the conversion of, of uh, St. Paul. Or, yes, known as Saul, but then he becomes Paul. And, and then, uh, which was his Greek name, Saul, his Hebrew name. <clears throat> and then we're going to, in chapter 10, hear some more about Peter and these become the two great characters of leading the the witness of the Christian faith in <clears throat> from this time on. We don't know a whole lot about the other apostles, a little bit, but uh, we know quite a bit about St. Peter and St. Paul. And we get their stories, uh, again, as uh, both of which are reaching out into the church and into the Gentile community, here, chapter 9, with with Saul, and in chapter 10 with Paul. But we'll get, uh, excuse me, with Peter. We'll get Peter next week um, on Monday. So uh, um, Acts chapter 9, let's begin with prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of your word and for these two great Christian leaders, Peter and Paul. Lord, you chose Saul. You knew before he was born, as, as you know all of us, uh, where we are going to be stationed in life and what your call on us is in life. Father, you used him to, uh, to touch the world with the message. And the way in which he was received by Ananias and Barnabas and the rest of the Christian community is a witness to all of us, Lord, about how we ought to live. Uh, how we ought to be open to the people you are bringing to the faith. Lord, I know that the, tonight as we're here Friday night, we know that the uh, Beijing Olympics have begun and, and China is on the world stage and Russia showed up with Putin uh, uh, meeting with we and and, and Lord, it's uh, we think about the Christians who are horribly persecuted in China and other ethnic groups as well. And China is going to try and put on this great propaganda. But every day that we see something about China in the Olympics, Lord, help us to remember to pray for the Christians in China who are this very day, this very hour, being persecuted, being imprisoned, being arrested, just what Saul was doing to them. The Chinese government is oppressing the church in, in, 
in China. And Lord, there are Christians imprisoned, Christians living in hiding, and there are Christians who are dying in China for the faith in Jesus Christ. And every day that the uh, Olympics are on, Lord, help us to never lose sight of our brothers and sisters who are suffering in that vast land under that authoritative or authoritarian regime. Lord, send them your Holy Spirit. Increase right now their boldness to witness, even as the early church did in the face of persecution. Increase their boldness. Lord, lead many to come to faith in Jesus through the witness of the church in China. In these days, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then, Lord, if there's any way we can encourage them in their faith, Lord, help us to do so. Well, we are into the story of Saul and his conversion. Chapter 9, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters so that to, so the synagogues of Damascus, um, or to the synagogues of Damascus, that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Remember, he had been going into homes and bringing people and binding them and putting them in prison. Well, he's he's trying to run out of folks in Jerusalem with the spread of the persecution that the church was spreading out into Judea and Samaria. And now he even wants to go beyond Judea and Samaria up into Damascus to go find Christians and persecute them. We're going to stamp out this church. Uh, his great teacher, he's not paying any attention any longer to what Gamaliel uh, had to say. Well, as he approached Damascus, here we go, verse 3. A light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. In others of his writings, Paul would say that he saw Jesus. So in that light, he saw Jesus, and he heard Jesus speaking to him. Now, we can hear Jesus. We can see Jesus many ways, but not physically. And when he saw Jesus, uh, he was blinded by by the vision of that light of Christ. And he heard the voice, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But rise and enter this city, and you will be told what you are to do. That's all he said. Get up, go in the city, and you'll be told what to do. Well, we're told then that the men who are traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, maybe seeing the great light, but they saw no one. It was visible. The, the vision of Jesus uh, was visible only to uh, to Saul. Um, but they heard the voice. They heard the message. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Go in the city and wait, and you will be told what to do. So Saul rose, as Jesus told him to do. He did it. And although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He was blind, and for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Now, we also know what he's doing besides neither eating nor drinking, That which means he's fasting. He's troubled by this vision of Jesus. And this encounter with Jesus has completely changed him. He thought everything of the Christian church was a lie. He thought the message was a lie because he thought Jesus had been killed. But now the message of the disciples that he'd heard time after time that you had killed him, but God raised him from the dead. He knows that's true. And when Stephen said he saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, Saul heard that. But he didn't believe it. But now he does. He has seen the risen Christ. 
and it makes him rethink everything he thought, and he's rethinking the scriptures. I am sure of that. And he's praying constantly. We know that from what we hear in just a moment. He's fasting and prayer, and he's not seeing anything. He's not distracted by anything he can see. And what he keeps hearing is that voice, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Remember that word of truth. That's what Stephen did. He spoke a word of truth and then of gospel. Uh, and the gospel message was, Father, forgive them. Uh, Lord Jesus, do not hold this sin against them. And Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit. Well, they heard uh, the, the truth from Stephen. He heard the truth and he heard the gospel. Now he has seen Jesus. And he, he was hearing the truth. You are persecuting me. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But the gospel was go. I will tell you what you should do. You will be told what you are to do. God has a purpose for him. That's gospel. And it has caused him to pray. He's not distracted by anything. He hears the voice ringing. And he, he's not distracted by seeing anything. But he's fasting and in prayer. Now we're told at that time, I think three days later, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. There were many disciples, but one of them was named Ananias. These verses coming up, especially two words, are among the most powerful two words in all of Scripture for me. One, you, you, they're unforgettable words. Ananias, uh, the Lord spoke to him in a vision. And Ananias knew the voice of God. It's just so critical for us as Christians to learn to discern God's voice in, in the word and in prayer. That when God speaks to us, perhaps in an unusual way, we'll know it's his voice. Well, Ananias heard the Lord speak to him in a vision, and he knew it was the Lord. Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. Just like Isaiah when God called him to go, whom, whom will I send? Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Ananias says, God said to, to uh, uh, the Lord Jesus said to uh, Ananias, Ananias, here I am. The Lord said, rise and go to a street named Straight and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. See, what's he been doing for three days? Fasting, not looking around, seeing anything, reflecting on the scriptures, fasting and praying. And he has seen a vision. He has seen in a vision a man called Ananias come to come and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Now, there's more to the story that God isn't telling Ananias, but this is all he needs to know. God comes to Ananias in a vision and said, there's another, I want specific words. Go to a street named Straight, to the house of a man named Judas, and you will find a man there praying. His name is Saul. Here's what I want you to do. Lay your hands on him that he may receive his sight. That's it. And, and he's, oh, he told him besides that, and this man saw, he has seen in a vision, a man by the name of Ananias, that's you, Ananias, come and lay his hands on him that he may receive his sight. And Ananias, <laughs> what the best parts of the story. <laughs> well, that's the second best part. <laughs> best part's coming up. Those great two words, just life-changing words for me. Uh, but the second best part, uh, Ananias wanted to help God out. <laughs> Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. <clears throat> now, Ananias is telling God this in case God doesn't know. <laughs> That's the funny part, isn't it? Just in case God doesn't know, Ananias wants to say, uh, Lord, you want me to go to this street named Straight, to the house of Judas, and you've told a guy by the name of Saul, that I'm going to come and pray for him and he's going to receive his sight. Now, you know, this is the guy who's been persecuting the church and here he has letters of approval to come and arrest and persecute us. 
What does God say? <laughs> God, in case you don't know, well, God doesn't mind us praying. And God's not perturbed by us trying to um, uh, inform him of something. <laughs> Although, isn't that funny? Us inform God of anything? Um, but you felt he needed to tell God, you know what you're asking me to do here. Yeah. Uh, likely as not, he could just, he'll see his, get his sight and he'll arrest me. So what does the Lord say to Ananias and his, his helpfulness in trying to tell God something he might not know? <laughs> the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. God said to Ananias, go. I have chosen him. He's going to be one of mine. He is one of mine. And he's going to bring the message of Jesus to Gentiles and the children, to kings and to the children of Israel. Boy, that's going to be the rest of the story of the book of Acts. It's going to bring the message to Gentiles and to kings and to the children of Israel. And by the way, he has caused much suffering. I know that. I will show him how much he will suffer. And Paul embraced the suffering that he, he experienced at the hands of many. We never hear him complaining about the suffering. I think that must be partly because of how much suffering he caused. And he knew how much suffering he caused. And so here he is. Um, God saying to Ananias, don't worry about this man. He's mine. He's going to do my work. And he's going to suffer. But that's between me and him. Don't you, you have a job here, Ananias. You go. And you lay your hands on him. And here comes this wonderful part of the story. Just touches my heart. I look forward to reading it any time I'm coming towards chapter 9. So Ananias departed. He just... God told him, go do this, and Ananias went and did it. This is, this is like Mary, like Mother Mary. <laughs> Lord, let it be to me according to your word. I am the handmaiden of the Lord. I, I'm just your servant. Do with me as you will. God told Ananias, go, and he departed, and he entered the house. And then here's this part. Laying his hands on him, he could have said anything in the world. But this is what he said. Ananias entered the house, laid his hands on him, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we hear that God has told him more. Now, maybe they had a little conversation before they got started with the prayer. And maybe Saul told him about his vision and encounter with Jesus on the road. I don't know how this all took place. But Ananias knows this, and, and, and I have no doubt that Saul is telling his story. But at some point after telling the story, Ananias comes over to him and lays his hands on his head and prays for him. And he doesn't just say, Saul, I'm going to pray for you. He says these two, these two best words, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, you are a child of God. And I am a child of God. And now, even though we've been enemies, you are my brother. You know, I started today just reminding us to pray every day that this Olympics is on for our brothers and sisters in China who are being persecuted. We have more in common with a Christian in China than we do with non-Christians in America because the blood of Jesus flows in and through them and in and through us. And washed in the blood of Jesus our fellow Christians in China who are being persecuted are our brothers and sisters. And even some who are persecutors will come to faith. And they too, like Saul, will be our brother and sister. 
I just love those two words. Brother Saul. This heart of Ananias trusting in the Father, trusting in Jesus who came to him in the vision, came and talked to, to Saul, listened to him, and then did exactly what God told him to do. Laid his hands and said, um, Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're told first, immediately, something like scales that, that blinded him with that blinding vision of Jesus. Something like scales fell from his eyes and he could see again. You know, this last week, my wife had cataract surgery and an implanted lens. That's kind of a miracle, I, I believe. And uh, uh, since third grade, she's, she's worn glasses. And in that eye, she now has 20-20 vision. What a miracle. Well, something like scales fell from, from uh, um, Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and then he received the Holy Spirit. And taking, taking food, uh, he broke his fast. After he'd been prayed for, and after he was baptized, after he regained his sight and was filled with the Holy Spirit, he took food and uh, he was strengthened. And then for some days, a period of time, he was with the disciples of Damascus. He was learning from them. They were teaching him about the Lord Jesus. And, and he was a well-trained scholar. So he knew the Old Testament. And the only Bible that the early Christians had was the Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament, but now he had a fresh eyes to see the New Testament. In his baptism and in filling with the Holy Spirit, God gave him an opened eyes to the word that the disciples had when they were filled with the Spirit. And so he immediately proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the Son of God. I've seen him on the road. And all who heard him were amazed. He's the one who was coming here to persecute. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ, proving from Scripture that Jesus is exactly the one that was foretold of by Moses, the law, and the prophets. And then it says, when many days had passed. There's, there's other scriptures in Corinthians and Galatians where Paul talks about going away to Arabia for a period of time, for a couple of years, and coming back. And the question is, when did he go away to Arabia? After he, at the end of this chapter, is sent off to, to Tarsus? Or is it, did he go away here and come back to Damascus? Um, it seems that he went away, and I think during that two-year period of time, at whatever point it was, he went through having memorized most of the scripture, and not only the, script, the Old Testament, but, but having memorized what rabbis taught about it. And now he was rehearing the message of Jesus and pouring through the scriptures and finding Christ everywhere. <clears throat> Did that happen right here or at another time? I'm not sure. Can't be positive, but it might have been here and might have come back. But then in verse 23, we're told when many days had passed, the Jews, and he might not have gone back away for two years and come back, it might have been just there in Damascus for a while. But when many days had passed, they're trying to kill him. The Jews are trying to kill him. But the disciples heard about it. This happens a number of times in Paul's life. And here he gets let down through an opening in the wall, uh, lowering him in a basket. And uh, he came to Jerusalem <laughs> out of the frying pan and into the fire goes back to Jerusalem, and he attempted to see the disciples, but they were afraid of him. Who shows up? Barnabas. The, and we're going to see him again showing up. The son of encouragement. Uh, Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and Barnabas told Saul's story. Barnabas declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of, the, of Jesus. And so with Barnabas' credentials, um, his, his bona fides, 
um, Peter or Paul or Saul went in and out among them in Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And opposition rose in Jerusalem from the Hellenists, the Jewish Christian, the the Jews who were from the Greek area uh, uh, around the Mediterranean world, and they were seeking to kill him. So the brothers then learned about it, and here again. Uh, they rescue him and send him off to his hometown of Tarsus. And we hear the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace. And being built up, so that was the area. It started in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, um, and even into Galilee. The church is, is spreading out, and God is bringing peace. And, and they're being built up, which means they're maturing in their faith, and they're multiplying. They're walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the church is growing. People are coming to faith. I pray for this kind of renewal through the work of, of Good Hope, that people not only join Good Hope, but that we are instrumental in leading people to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, let's join in prayer for that. The chapter ends, and it's just getting time for us to close in another couple of minutes, back with Peter. And we hear that Peter is in Lydda. He heals a man by the name of Ananias, uh, Aeneas, excuse me, um, who has been paralyzed and he's healed and people come to faith because of that. And then in Joppa, there's a disciple by the name of Tabitha or as she's known, Dorcas, um, just the Greek way of her Hebrew name, Tabitha. And she was just a wonderful saint. She died. And immediately hearing that, that Peter wasn't far away, Brothers sent for Peter, and he came. And when he came to the room, he heard about uh, Tabitha. And uh, the widows were standing there, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made. Um, Peter put them all outside, and he knelt down beside the bed where they had laid her. And he prayed. And then he spoke, and he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. What a miracle. She'd been dead for some hours, taking a while to go from Lida to, to Joppa and back. Um, she'd been dead for some time. But Peter said, arise. And she opened her eyes, and she saw Peter and sat up. And he presented her to the saints alive. And that became known in all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. May God do his work among us and answer our prayers and create some miracles among us and give us an ability to tell people about Jesus and what he is doing in their lives. Well, you know the part of this story I liked the best was that Saint Ananias who obeyed God, who, who had a prayer, a life of prayer, could hear God speak to him and just knew that the Holy Spirit had told him to go and pray for this persecutor of the church that had come to faith and to trust God and lay his hands on him. And, and he did all that, but God didn't tell him to take that next step. It, 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 at least it's not recorded that way, but but God trusted, or or um, Ananias trusted the Lord. He went and he heard, he heard Saul. He knew that Saul had come to faith in Christ. And those two rich words, brother Saul. Again, we're gonna close with a word of prayer. And I'm going to remember our brothers and sisters in China, uh, North Korea, everywhere where they're persecuted. But because China is trying to win its propaganda game, let's, let's remember our brothers and sisters persecuted by the Chinese regime. Lord, you can turn a persecutor into a brother and sister in Christ. Father, we pray for the church in China and around the world that is persecuted. We pray along with our brothers and sisters, for those who persecute them. I remember the movie Richard Wormbrand, Tortured for Christ, that we saw a couple years back, and how he was praying daily, and his persecutor laughed at him. Why are you praying? God never answers your prayers. And he turned, well, I'm praying for you. Lord, we join with the church around the world that is persecuted in praying for their persecutors, that they can turn from the evil of their ways that they don't know, like, like, 
like Stephen, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Lord, we pray that you would forgive them and you would also send your son, Jesus, your Holy Spirit to them in a vision that they might see Christ and that they might come to faith in Jesus and that you would use the Christians who are being persecuted in China, North Korea, uh, around the world, um, that, Lord, you would use the, the, the church, the Christians, to lay their hands on those who are getting baptized and call them brother and sister. Lord, may this time be a time of renewal for your church through good hope in America, in China, and around the world. Thank you for the witness of Ananias and the boldness of a church that got beyond the past and could look at each other and say, brother, sister, help us to look at one another with those eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining with me tonight, and and uh, I'll, uh, I'm going to uh, get changed here and finish preparing for my uh, message for Sunday, and then videotape it tonight, and uh, hopefully send that out that people can watch on Sunday. And uh, I don't feel badly, but I do invite your prayers for Nina, that she get over the flu that she's had here for a couple days, and she is getting over it, and that God would hasten the uh, my time of being sick with COVID that I can be uh, reconnected with doing what he wants me to be doing at church and in the community. Uh, God bless you. And remember, God loves you. And so do I. Bye-bye.